Conservative peeps who are on the stream, this class is absolutely dedicated to you. Those of you who are talk about the liberal narrative, the liberal media, the liberal this, the liberal that, I'm going to be on your team today and we're going to talk all about the liberal narrative and the liberal media. <laughs> and what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about it in a way to sort of bring it to light for those of us who identify as being more liberal and then you don't see it. It's like the fish in water, when the, the fish is the last being to, to really understand water, right? Because you just grow up with water. Water is just a part of what, what life is. It's like us with air. If I told you you had to try to explain air to somebody, how would you explain air? That's kind of how liberalism and conservatism is. If, you're, if you grow up with it and you're sort of steeped in it, you often don't see see it around you. And so I'm going to talk about the liberal narrative and the liberal media today in a way to show you the way it comes into play or in, in the world of race relations. So we finished the class yesterday with this example of this guy. And, you know, one thing I didn't say, I mean, I want to say this, this guy later had to, to apologize for his comments about Jesus being, the, the, you know, the, the greatest hunter, right, uh, of Jews. So the, the, the idea is how do you convert Jews? And it's just like, wait, hang on a minute, what are you saying, right? What are we really talking about here? Are you implying that the way we should be converting Jews is like how Hitler converted Jews and so on and so forth? It's like, what are you really saying? And so when it comes out, he's really close to this guy and this guy doesn't, he, he says, yeah, I don't support those views and so on and so forth. But he still has a relationship with this guy and this guy still has his entire church and his religious foundation and he doesn't, get, he doesn't have to hide his face under a rock. He does not pull away. People aren't calling for his head. People aren't calling for him to resign. People aren't calling for him like, one thing after another, nor are they with this guy. Saying, look, you have, not only do you have to disavow this guy, but you have to call him the scum of the earth, and you have to one thing after another after another. And if you don't do that, then you should resign from being a senator. You think like, wow, that's pretty hardcore. Well, let me ask you, what would happen if he had said, you know, the problem with black people is black Americans, they really need to get on board with embracing American culture. And, you know, you fish for them, you, you show it to them, you give it to them, and if they don't take it, then you force them. And if you don't force them, well, you know what happens. Well, we have nooses. Like, we have other ways to address Jewish people who won't get in line. We have other ways to address black people who won't get in How far do you think that guy's career would go if he started talking about nooses and black people and bringing black people into line? And it shows when you think about this is the, the narrative. This is the way we think about race in the United States. Black people have a lot of power in many, many ways. And black people have less power in other ways. And if you don't see that, and if you don't walk into that, and if you don't break it down, and if you're not willing to really deconstruct it all, then you're not willing to critically examine race relations. Because that's part of race relations. Now, some of you maybe aren't really fully believing me on this. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to give you a few stories of how just fairly recently, the liberal media, the liberal narrative has woven its way into U.S. race relations in ways that are really shocking even for somebody like myself when we decide to actually look at what's behind the story. So to help me with this first piece, I need probably, I need two black people from class who are like, who would consider yourself maybe the, the most radical people in class. I need people who are pretty intransigent about racism. Do you know this? Do you know the story of this guy? Yes. yes. You know, you know what happened? Yes. What happened? I don't really remember. I kind of left the news. What do you, what do you know? Of what I know I don't know the specific details, but I know that obviously what the headline says that the founder used the n-word on a conference call. He and dropped the n-bomb. Everybody like, yeah. boycotted Papa John's pizza. What's that? Everybody boycotted Papa John's. People boycotted that. Papa yeah. John's and the whole nine yards. Okay, so we're going to talk about what happened. I'm going to give you the best. So I've investigated this as best as I can, looking at it from a lot of different perspectives, and I'm going to walk you through what actually happened, okay? I want you to, well, I'm going to have a bunch of questions for you about what you think. So what do you think about the fact he dropped the n-bomb and and he was forced to resign. He's on a conference call. He's dropping the M-bomb. And they're like, dude, that's really uncool. First Sounds about all, right. a conference call is kind of like an awkward time 
people have their justifications for using the N-word at certain times, but a conference call is just not a good time at all, regardless. Okay. Inappropriate setting, probably just inappropriate for me at all. It's a business conference call. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So here's what's up with this guy. I mean, he started Papa John's Pizza, and like he's a business guy, and there's franchises all over the U.S., all over the world, and make a lot of money, and there's a lot of money in pizza, I guess, because he makes a lot of money in the franchise, and everybody makes a lot of money. When the NFL players were taking a knee, in 20, it really reached a peak in 2017 season, season before last, Papa John's is the official pizza sponsor of the NFL. And so he comes out at some point and he says, listen, NFL, you got to get your shit together. Because, like, come on, this is really cutting into our profits. This is cutting, this is a problem for not only my company, but for lots of other companies. Now, in my company, by him, it's not just him. He doesn't make all the money. These are franchises and franchisees. So there are people who make a living off and send their children to college from, and so on and so forth, and from the profits they make from their franchises from Papa John's. So this isn't just like him making a, having a bunch of stock. And people are saying, come on, man. This is Black Lives Matter. Like, come on, this is serious. And he's like, look, I get it, it's Black Lives Matter, NFL, but I'm running a business here. Can you deal with the players and work it out? Business majors, you got it, right? He has his obligation. Is it to the NFL players first, or is it to his franchises and his operations and his stockholders first? Which one is it? He also gave money to the Trump campaign. So immediately, what does that mean about him? He supports semi-racist to racist comments if he's giving money to the Trump campaign. Okay, so he supports racism, so you expect him to say racist things. You don't expect him to say racist things out loud, maybe, in, in a conference call, but... No, 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 I'm you, not saying you do, but, yeah. like, if you ask... If I yeah. went around with a microphone, if I did a man or woman on the street interview, and I said, hey, this guy gave money to the Trump campaign... It means he doesn't mind. Not racism not. doesn't make him angry enough to not give money. Okay, he, got it. He tolerates it. Like, he doesn't see it as a... Problem. Okay, so now let's take it to the next step. And again, I don't know. I wasn't in the conference call. All I know is I'm just digging around for every little bit of information I get. And I'm going to give you to the best of my ability what actually happened here. Okay, so first off, he hires, the, the company hires this because things go south. He steps down as the CEO. And then they hire this PR company called the, La the Laundry Service, okay? And the Laundry Service is a New York City, Madison Avenue PR firm. And, you know, they come in and they're trying to fix things. You actually have an image problem because people think you don't like black people and that you're racist because you support Trump and you're coming out against taking a knee. Why don't you just be quiet? And so we got to work on this image issue because that's what happens, right? You work on image. So he's on the conference call with them. But in the, and then in the conference call it comes out that he drops the end bomb. A couple days later, he resigns as chair of Papa John's, the chair of the board. And then look at this. Papa John's CEO finally learned the lesson the media exercise was trying to teach. The media exercise was with the PR firm that racism is bad for business. He's clearly a racist. So let me walk you through what happened on the call. So these guys are saying, you got to get your image together. We're all in this big, it's a conference call, right? So you're just, just listening out. You got to get your image together. Like, what's up? He's like, look, yeah, I don't really understand what the issue is. And they're saying, well, we have an idea for you. Listen, what you're going to do is, we're going to, how about if we hire Kanye West as a spokesperson? This would be good. Kanye, because it's Kanye, you know, whatever. Schneider says, nah, man, I'm not hiring Kanye West because he drops the N-bomb in his lyrics. And I'm not, I don't support that. I'm not really into that. And they're like, well, what? Yeah, but he would be a good spokesperson for you. He'd be really good. I don't care. He's dropping the M-bomb in his lyrics. That's not the image I want for Papa John's pizza. Other people drop the M-bomb. So imagine, he's not talking to a room. He's talking to a microphone. Other people drop the M-bomb. Colonel Sanders regularly said M-bomb, and nobody cared. But I'm not dropping it. And they're saying oh, well, hang on a second. I'm not really getting, like, this is a problem. Someone's like, I'm a little bit uncomfortable here. He's like, look, I get racism. Where I grew up in Indiana, when black people got out of line, people used to get there in their pickup trucks and go get black people and drag them around in the backs of their pickup trucks. I get racism. It's like, I don't support racism. I don't support trapping the M-bomb. I don't support any of that. That's the call. 
Now it comes out, John Schnatter dropped the N-bomb. Now, I feel some kind of way about this. Because if I had said in this classroom, so this guy in his conference call said, hey, Colonel Sanders used to say, and I actually said it. I'd do the same thing that he did. I'm responding to something else in the context of a call that's really valuable and important. Look, the most, probably the most well-known fast food giant and titan anywhere in the world is Colonel Sanders. And he used to drop the M-bomb all the time. And in the context of that conversation, using the word isn't really that out of line. Just Why? like, what was, <laughs> you're thinking the same thing. If Why? He, wh- okay, if he was using the acronym the entire time before, why in that specific moment? No, he didn't he use s- the acronym. He just said it once. That was when he said yeah, it. Yeah, but then he why never why he he just said the uh, M- Colonel Sanders said so the N word all the time? Because yeah. been- you understand that you're not supposed to say it. That's why you didn't just say oh, it. Oh, no, 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 hang so on. So you use the N word. So why would he feel why like it was comfortable to just say it in the moment? That <laughs> he could have said Colonel Sanders used the N word all the time and he never did blah, blah, blah. Why did he have to say Colonel Sanders says? Okay, so hang on. You ready? So you're telling me that this guy right here, because he's quoting somebody else in the context that makes it's a not lot a of sense. research paper. You don't have to quote word for word. Of all the things happening in the world related to black people and brown people and genocide and one thing after another after another, this guy, because he said one word in the context of quoting somebody else, should lose his entire... It's like... Well, it makes sense. He loses his entire pizza empire. He has to step down as CEO. Well, he we weren't talking about the entire human. context, though. We're talking specifically about the owner, Papa John's, not talking about relating all of this to everything else. In that specific instance, if they feel like it was necessary, why? Well, I don't understand. If he could have said, there's a thousand, oh my gosh, so many other words in the English dictionary. And we know that there's an Sanders acronym. Said, but that's not what Colonel Sanders well, said. Why did he have to say it? Sean brought up at one point, why do people feel like they ha- want to say it so bad? Why does he want to say it so bad? Being devil's Here. advocate, though, I kind of feel bad for him. Like, if it was in that context, then maybe it was a bit extreme for him to lose his entire empire. But I still don't think he needed to necessarily say the full word in the context of the conversation. Okay, so let me ask you this. Papa John's founder yeah, used well, we the know N that word the media, in a We know that the media, the media does skew things just to create conflict controversy so that but had that not happened he wouldn't have lost his job have they had it come out in the media to say hey this guy was quoting colonel sanders dropping the m-bomb and he dropped the m-bomb in the process of quoting he wouldn't have lost his job even nothing would have happened it would have been like oh yeah dude yeah i got it so okay so you would go there you'd be there on that yeah Yeah. so this takes it to this is though the power that black people have to determine at some level this it's because it's a power of white people the fear of white people dude even me even me who says the most outrageous things in the world even here even in the context of this conversation i am not going to say that word because it could be the last day of my job and i'm like are you kidding me of all the things that i say of all the things i could say of all the things that are happening in the effing world me just dropping that single word will be enough to say sam richards drop the n bomb in class fire that mfer like this is where we're at so like you're, there's no one in this room that I, because I study that I, I get it more than anyone in the room. Like all the, the hidden ways in which the two of you are discriminated against in ways that you will never see, and certainly people with light skin will never see and never understand. But you'll never even see it. It's worse than what you would imagine, right? So you don't have the power to stop discrimination, but there's a power here over white people cowering in fear. I think it's definitely different, though, when you're like a person like Papa John's is a huge name. When you're a public figure and your name is out there, you are at greater risk. But if you're just an everyday person, you can do it and face. Okay, so what about this? So let's go back four years. We're doing the live stream. Um, Somebody wrote something in on a a YouTube comment and they dropped the M-bomb. And so we put it up there and I read it because it was small type and people can read and I read it. And I said the word, because I'm reading it. I'm like, come on, this is a race for these guys. And first, you know what I mean? Like, what am I going to do? And da 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 n bomb and go. And so I just like, yeah, whatever. I'm just reading it. 
If you find that video and we put it out in the world and Sam Richards dropped the N-bomb, look, we have video to show that. And you got people calling for my head. And I, did, and I didn't skip over the word because I just thought that was hypocritical to do in a class like this. I think that sometimes things are, the consequences are extremely harsh because it wants to be proven, it wants to be out there that it's no exception. Zero tolerance is what I'm saying. Yeah, I so got you. that, I, I don't know if I'd agree with having your head or you losing your yeah. job, but the point of zero tolerance is because people still use it casually. They still say it whenever they want to. Yeah. And if you don't get a part, if you don't get to the point of zero tolerance if you say oh, okay well then maybe that's okay sometimes and other people will be like eh, yeah well I know that my situation isn't the exact same but I'm going to use it because yeah. I think that that one time that that person didn't so get in trouble so yeah you got to have yeah. zero tolerance to start off with and to make sure that everyone knows this is not acceptable this is not a word that we use etc cetera, etc cetera. and that's what's going on here zero tolerance okay th I think that's a fair response what this also shows me, and now what it's showing to a lot of other folks, what this, show, what this also says is, wow, man, if he's like, I get the zero tolerance thing, I got it, right? Like I have zero tolerance for a lot of things. The problem is what it also does is tell people we shouldn't have a conversation because it's like, damn, if I, okay, I can't say it like that. Well, what other words, what else can I, what else am I going to say that I'm going to get Shit. And then what it says to people, just be quiet. Don't say anything because this is too dangerous. Then we don't have real honest and open. We don't have any conversations. I agree with that, but for like different reasons. I think people are either pushed to like be quiet and not say anything or people don't have conversations so they don't understand why certain communities think it's like unacceptable for like other groups to use it. So like, if you try to tell someone you can't use that word, they're just gonna get angry and just kind of block you out and block your explanation out and continue to you know, push the fact that they wanna use it and they should use it because it's just a word. And then the people who stay quiet don't understand really why they're staying quiet, but they just don't wanna step into that territory. So I think both like circumstances are equally bad and it's all kind okay. of like produced because okay. people don't for, talk about it. For me, I found, I mean, I have an abundance of white friends. I grew up in a suburban area of Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and I know that they, if they have a question, like there's me and there's three other girls that grew up in our friend group that they come and ask before they would go out and say anything. So I think you're right on the silence part of it, but they do that. There are some conversations being held with people that they're comfortable with. Okay. 